Hey, tonight is the hell of chapter 7. Behold, now it came to pass in the sixty and ninth year of the reign of the judges over the people of the Nephites, that Nephi, the son of Helaman, returned to the land of Zarahemla from the land northward. For he had been forth among the people who were in the land northward, and did preach the word of God unto them, and did prophesy many things unto them. And they did reject all his words, insomuch that he could not stay among them, but returned again unto the land of his nativity. Nephi is uh, the central person in the story at this point. And it says that he had uh, taken a little trip to do some preaching of the word of God, uh, had gone to the land northward, and now was returning to the land of Zarahemla, which was kind of the hometown. As you can see in verse uh, 2, it says, He did preach the word of God to them, the prophet made things. However, verse 3 says, They did reject all his words. Okay, so, in so much, they couldn't even stay there, but was ready to just to go back home. So, you know, we have read at times about some trips that were successful, and some not so successful, so this is one of the not so successful ones. And it would be discouraging, obviously, that you know, if you're going to preach the word of God, it's with the hope and the intent that the people's hearts will be open to receive the message. So to preach the word of God and have it be rejected is discouraging, right? So that's what uh, we had here, and it's, uh, especially if it was almost like completely rejected. You know, okay, it's one thing if, okay, this day not so good, the next day is better, the, but to... Make a trip, you would assume multiple days and speak, preach the word of God, and it was totally rejected. Nobody was interested, so it's uh, going, going back home, right? And so now he's back home and uh, thinking about what it is that he uh, went through here and how the word of God was rejected among all the people. These are the people of the Nephites, his, his people. And seeing the people in a state of such awful wickedness, and those Gadianton robbers filling the judgment seats, having usurped the power and authority of the land, laying aside the commandments of God, and not in the least a right before him, doing no justice unto the children of men, condemning the righteous because of their righteousness, letting the guilty and the wicked go unpunished because of their money, and moreover to be held in office at the head of government, to rule and do according to their wills, that they might get gain and glory of the world, and moreover that they might the more easily commit adultery and steal and kill and do according to their own wills. Now this great iniquity had come upon the Nephites in the space of not many years, and when Nephi saw it, his heart was swollen with sorrow within his breast, and he, he did exclaim in the agony of his soul. So as Nephi is contemplating what he's uh, been through, what he's experienced, and kind of the state of affairs, and you, know, you see things that are um, reminiscent of what we read last week in chapter 6, right? saying that the, the awful wickedness, the, the, the Gadianton and robbers are filling the, the judgment seats. The Gadianton and robbers were a secret society, right, that they had people in many places, including in the government, and they were able to go in and uh, put their people in place and, you know, kind of key positions. And now, I mean, they're even in the judgment seat, right? So that they really had taken over the, the government. And uh, as you can see, they said they usurped the power and authority, they're laying aside the commandments of God, you know, con condemning those who were trying to be righteous, which is righteous as somebody trying to do what God wants them to do, and letting the wicked go unpunished. So it was totally backwards, right? If you were trying to be... I'll say good in the sight of God, that that was bad, and if you were going to be wicked, that was good. So this was the uh, agenda that they were bringing out. Okay. So, they, so they, this is what he was uh, looking at, and so you can see in verse 5 kind of some of the, the detail of what they were doing, so it's to, to gain in glory, to commit adultery, steal, kill, and, and so forth. All right. And so this, this is what Nephi is looking at and saying, gee, it's turned around so quickly, you know, it says in verse 6, and not many years, this, this totally changed around. And it, we were doing very well, and now, and, and now it's a mess. You know, now that I look around, all I see is sin everywhere, and, uh, and wickedness, and wicked people in high places, and, uh, and I don't know where we go from here. Oh, that I could have had my days in the days when my father Nephi first came out of the land of Jerusalem, that I could have joyed with him in the promised land. Then were his people easy to be entreated, firm to keep the commandments of God, and slow to be led to do iniquity, and they were quick to hearken unto the words of the Lord. Yea, if my days could have been in those days, then would my soul have had joy in the righteousness of my brethren. But behold, I am consigned that these are my days, and that my soul shall be filled with sorrow, because of this the wickedness of my brethren. He's looking at what he's facing today, and say, man, it wouldn't have been nice to have lived years ago, back when things were good. You know, back when you could talk to people about God and they were actually happy to hear it, right? Instead of turning a deaf ear or being wicked or rejecting it. And uh, that's what he says. He says, well, when my father, Nephi, first came out of the land of Jerusalem, now this is the original Nephi. This would be going back, you know, 500 years. But, uh, yeah, they would consider that as a time that was 
uh, filled with joy and so forth. Now, sometimes when you think back to, to previous times and, you know, you, you remember, if you will, the good things about it and you say, you know, you kind of almost romanticize it in your, in your head, you know, you think back, oh, what, what a great time that was, right? But we read here the account of, of, of Nephi when he came over from the land of Jerusalem and, and it wasn't exactly uh, all happy times, all right? I mean, his brothers were trying to kill him and, and uh, so he was, you know, constantly facing uh, opposition from his brothers and, and such, and eventually they had, when the, his father died, they had to split and go separate ways because the brothers were going to kill him. So it, it wasn't, I mean, he was tied up on a ship, you know, for, for three days until the ship was going to go over. So it, it, it was not exactly all just joy and happiness, but, you know, you remember the, the, the good things, you know. So, the, so again, that can be like a lesson to all of us, is, you know, you can think back to a previous time and say, oh, how nice and peaceful it was then, you know. I mean, if I want to say, well, gee, at the time that my grandparents lived, it was, you know, it wasn't such a hectic life as it was today, and it was just nice and peaceful. They lived during the Depression, right? But I'd like to, to have, you know, not had any, any food or money, you know, or anything, and uh, to have to work for two cents an hour, you know, it's, uh, so it was a very hard time then in a different way. So, yes, it was more peaceful, but it was also a harder time to, to live. So it, every era of time has its, its good and its bad points, but, you know, when we were faced with all the challenge of our particular day, that we could say, gee, if we, if we just roll the clock back a few years, we wouldn't have all this. Right? We'd have this, but you'd have something else. So everybody has their, their challenge. But Nephi here is, is saying that, uh, you know, it, looking at all this wickedness, wouldn't it have been nice to live during a time when there were people who would hear the, the word of God? So, and he concludes that after, you know, kind of thinking about that way for a verse or two. And he says, but this is my time. You know, the, to, today is the time that I'm assigned to, so I need to do what I need to do in this day and age, just as we need to do what we need to do in this day and age. We're assigned to this era, this, this is our time. So. And behold, now it came to pass that it was upon a tower, which was in the garden of Nephi, which was by the highway, which led to the chief market, which was in the city of Zarahemla. Therefore Nephi had bowed himself upon the tower, which was in his garden, which tower was also near unto the garden gate, by which led the highway. And it came to pass that there were certain men passing by, and saw Nephi as he was pouring out his soul unto God upon the tower. And they ran and told the people what they had seen, and the people came together in multitudes, that they might know the cause of so great mourning for the wickedness of the people. And now when Nephi arose, he beheld the multitudes of people who had gathered together. And Nephi had a, a little tower in his, on his property apparently, and was up in the, the tower doing this. I know it would be like if we had like a, a platform, a raised platform out in front of this property, let's say. It's right by the, right, right by the highway, right by Levittown Parkway. And so, so if, if I was up there in, in, in the tower, and, uh, you know, when it says he explained the agony of his soul, see, he, he wasn't thinking these things, and he was saying it. So, so again, that, picture me out on a little tower out in the front of the property, you know, saying, I wish I, would, I, wish I lived in a better time than this, you know, and, and this is a terrible time to live, and everybody's so sinful, right? That people, hey, what, what's, what's that guy doing up there, right? And that's, that's what they're, they're doing, so people who are hearing him kind of talking to apparently himself, all right, and they, they're coming around to hear what, what he's saying. It says, well, what's, what's he doing up there? What's, what's he saying? What's he talking about? Why is he uh, yelling? And uh, what, what's this, this all about? So they're coming to check it out and see, you know, yeah, I guess even at that time it was a spectacle to see somebody up on a tower to, yelling at nobody. So they wanted to go see what it was that he, that he was saying, and then now they're going to react to what, he, what he's saying to them. And it came to pass that he opened his mouth and said unto them, Behold, why have ye gathered yourselves together, that I may tell you of your iniquities? Yea, because I have got upon my tower, that I might pour out my soul unto my God, because of the exceeding sorrow of my heart, which is because of your iniquities. And because of my mourning and lamentation, ye have gathered yourselves together, and do marvel. Yea, and ye have great need to marvel. Yea, ye ought to marvel, because ye are given away, that the devil has got so great hold upon your hearts. Yea, how could you have given way to the enticing of him, who is seeking to hurl away your souls down to everlasting misery and endless woe. You know, you might think that the Nephi in the tower there and the people coming around to listen, that he would say something that would be comforting to them, right? Or that would be uh, politically correct to say to them, or might talk about some other people that are... But none of that is the case, all right? He basically... Let them have it. Open his mouth and said, Behold, what, why, why are you all here? So that I can tell you about your iniquities? So I can tell you how, how uh, displeased God is with you? 
So I can tell you how the devil has got hold of you and it's going to lead you to endless woe, right? So he's basically saying, is that why you came? Do you want to hear me, hear me say it, right? And so he's telling them, that that's why I'm up here. That's why I'm upset. That's why I'm uh, if you will, complaining to God because all you people are, are sinful. All you people are in, are in iniquity. You're not caring about God. You're doing what's wrong in the, his sight. And so that's very uh, discouraging for me as a, a minister of God to, to think that that's... My people, the Nephites, this is what, what you're doing. So, so he's, not, he's not holding back, all right? So sometimes, you, sometimes you just need to deliver the message as it is. And so here, that's what he's doing, right? Or repent ye, repent ye. Why will ye die? Turn ye, turn ye unto the Lord your God. Why is he forsaken you? It is because you have hardened your hearts. Yea, ye will not hearken unto the voice of the good shepherd. Yea, ye have provoked him to anger against you. And behold, instead of gathering you, except ye will repent... Behold, he shall scatter you forth, that ye shall become meat for dogs and wild beasts. There's no value in just telling somebody how sinful they are and leaving it at that. Right? It, that there should be some action that can be taken. Right? Because as we know, that things are never hopeless with, with God. That, you know, there's always the opportunity to repent. So if somebody is sinful, and if, if you are going to be the one pointing out that they're sinful, it should always be followed by, then now you need to repent. And now you can repent, and God is open to hear your repentance, but it, that is what has to happen. So there is always an action that can be taken. And uh, he says, well, you know, what, why are you going to die? Says, look, look, look to God. He, you know, he, the only reason you think he's forsaken you is because you've walked away from him. Right? It's not that God turns his back on people because he doesn't like them, right? or because he's uh, in, in a bad mood today, right? but rather if it's somebody turns their back on him, well then, then of course they have no, no communication with God. And that, that's all that's happened. So it wasn't that God has forsaken them, but they've really forsaken God. Right? So it's says, you harden your hearts, you don't listen to the voice of the good shepherd, it's, you provoke them to anger. Okay, so except you repent, well now whatever happens is on you. So that's what he's telling them. He says, now, now you need to repent. That's, the, that's, that's your next action here. You, you've sinned, you've not, not listened to God, now you need to repent. Oh, how could you have forgotten your God in the very day that he has delivered you? But behold, it is to get gain, to be praised of men, Yea, and that ye might get gold and silver. And ye have set your hearts upon the riches and the vain things of this world, for the which ye do murder, and plunder, and steal, and bear false witness against your neighbor, and do all manner of iniquity. And for this cause woe shall come unto you, except ye shall repent. For if ye will not repent, behold this great city, and also all those great cities which are round about, which are in the land of our possession, shall be taken away, that ye shall have no place in them. For behold, the Lord will not grant unto you strength, as he has hitherto done, to withstand against your enemies. Right, so in 20 and 21, it's saying, you know, why would you have done this, right? Why, why would you have turned your back on God? And then in 21, it's saying, why, right? It's saying that to, to, to get gain, to be praised of men, right? To, 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 to sit hard upon riches, the main things of the world. And you know, all the same things that come up from time to time throughout the, the narrative of the Book of Mormon, also the same kind of things that are in place today. As you set your heart upon riches and upon things in the world, well, now God can't be first anymore. And so now, of course, now they're into all the, the sinful things. And you, know, you can recognize some of these are things that would have been mentioned in the Ten Commandments. You know, it says that, you know, murder and plunder and steal and bear false witness and so forth. You know, it says you're breaking all the commandments of, of God, right? Doing all manner of iniquity, right? So you, you really come pretty far afield here, right? And so because you've, you've done this, if you don't repent, so something else is going to happen, and what God wouldn't protect them or help them or give them strength against their enemies, and as a result, they would even lose the cities that they have. Having read the last however many chapters we have, right, you, you see all, all the wars that they were fighting with the Lamanites was over cities, right? They, you know, so who's got the city, right? The, uh, the Lamanites are attacking, they, they take away the city, the, the Nephites come back and they fight against them, and they take the city back, right? And so all the cities, it was back and forth, that they were the the, the prizes or the tokens in all the wars that they did. So at this point, and if you remember a couple of chapters ago when the Lamanites were converted, what, what they did was they, they gave all the cities back. So all the cities that we took from you, we're, we're going to give them all back, all right? They didn't have to fight over them, we're just going to give it back. So owning the city or, you know, being in charge of the city was a big deal. So now it says, well, if you're going to, not going to repent, you're going to lose this, the city because you wind up another war, and God's not going to give, give you strength to, to win the war, so you're going to wind up losing these cities that, uh, that you fought so hard for, and that was that's such a big deal to us. 
For behold, thus saith the Lord, I will not show unto the wicked of my strength to one more than the other, save it be unto those who repent of their sins and hearken unto my words. Now therefore I would that ye should behold, my brethren, that it shall be better for the Lamanites than for you, except ye shall repent. For behold, they are more righteous than you, for they have not sinned against that great knowledge which ye have received. Therefore the Lord will be merciful unto them, yea, he will lengthen out their days and increase their seed, even when thou shalt be utterly destroyed, except thou shalt repent. Yea, woe be unto you because of that great abomination which has come among you, and ye have united yourselves unto it, yea, to that secret band which was established by Gadianton. If you're not going to repent, right, it says it's going to, you're going to be worse off than the Lamanites, okay? It says, right, it says in 23, it, says, it shall be better for the Lamanites for, for you, except ye shall repent, right? Because in 24 it says, behold, they're more, they're more righteous than you. So, I mean, that's, that's number one, is that as we've just been saying the last chapter or two, that the Lamanites' righteousness now exceeds that of the Nephites, and, you know, for, for their whole history, the Lamanites were always the wicked ones. And so, if you want to talk about people who were unrighteous, they would use the Lamanites as an example. You know, it, I'm sure they probably said, if you want to be wicked, you'll be like the Lamanites then, all right? Don't be as wicked as the Lamanites. Well, now, suddenly the Lamanites are more righteous than they are, so it would be better for them than for you. But, in, in addition to them being more righteous, there's another example that he gave as to why it would be better for the Lamanites. And what says this? For they have not sinned against that great knowledge which you have received. See, that when when you have more knowledge and more information, well, you know, it's expected that you'll do something with that. So sometimes people can claim ignorance, I suppose. You know, they can say, well, I, I didn't know or I wasn't taught, and so I didn't really know what to do. Right? So that's, I guess, an excuse. But uh, if you know what to do and, and you're sitting against it, well, that's, that's a lot worse, obviously. And so that's what he's saying. The, the, the Nephites have been taught all along the ways of God. So for you to turn your back, on that, that that's, that's pretty bad, right? The, the Lamanites weren't taught even as much as you were. So even if, even if they were the same at this point, the, the Lamanites are better off because you're, you're sitting against the knowledge and the Lamanites, whatever they're doing wrong, was, it may be an ignorance. So even if they were at the same level, the Lamanites would be better off, but it's not even that way. The Lamanites are more righteous than, than the Nephites at this point. In, in 25 now it says, you know, we'll be unto you because of the great abomination and, and the, the main abomination he's referring to is that, you know, you're part of this secret band of, of Gadianton. So that, now they're the new examples of what the worst people can be, right? That we have the Gadianton robbers who are uh, killers and uh, thieves and uh, people who have infiltr infiltrated the, the government. And we've already said we compare them to the, the mob today, right? So these are the, the, the most wicked of all the people. And, and now the Nephites have embraced this group and are, and are part of it. So... So they, you know, this is how far you've sunk. You, you're now down to the lowest level of uh, people in, in existence here today, the, the Gadianton and robbers. So it's, to, to say you're one of them means you've really gotten as far away from God as possible, because as we've seen in all these other verses here, the, the, the Gadianton and robbers, what's, what, what's good is, is bad, and what's bad is good. So they've got it totally backwards in terms of the teachings of, of God. And so if you're with them, then you're definitely not with, with God. Yea, woe shall come unto you because of that pride which ye have suffered to enter your hearts, which has lifted you up beyond that which is good because of your exceeding great riches. Yea, woe be unto you because of your wickedness and abominations. And except ye repent, ye shall perish. Yea, even your lands shall be taken from you, and ye shall be destroyed from off the face of the earth. Behold now, I do not say that these things shall be of myself, because it is not of myself that I know these things, but behold, I know that these things are true, because the Lord God has made them known unto me. Therefore I testify that they shall be. Wrapping up this uh, speech, and again, remember where Nephi is delivering the speech from. He's in the tower. He's in this, this tower, and you know, and I, say, I, I call it like a, a little tower, because obviously it couldn't have been too tall, or they wouldn't be able to hear him. So, you know, so it's just enough that they can all see him, but they can hear so they hear what he's saying. They won't gather around to hear this, and they, they stayed and they listened to this whole uh, speech. And so now as he's wrapping it up, he's saying that, you know, woe shall come unto you because of the pride that's in it, into your hearts and because of your wickedness and abominations. You know, woe shall, shall come unto you. All right? and, and so you need to repent or else you're going to lose the, the lands and you're going to suffer the, the punishment of God. And, uh, and, uh, and if you're, if you're going to be mad at me, it's not, I'm not making up these words. It says there, it says, I know these things are true because God's made them known unto me. All right? so, so God's the one who gave me these words, and I'm just telling, I'm bringing you the message from him. Right? It's, it's not me 
inventing it, but God is the one who's uh, said these words, so you need to be aware of this. So the wise woe is going to come unto you unless you repent.